Chapter 9, Consistency and Consensus. So far, in the last few videos, we learned a very important concept of transaction as an abstraction that the application developers use. Similarly, in this video, we're going to learn about yet another abstraction called consensus. And this is something that we heavily need to depend on when we use distributed systems. So let's take some examples to understand when consensus is needed, right? Let's, let's say a husband and a wife share a bank account. They both are trying to debit and their bank account, let's say, has $100. And they both are trying to take out the $100 at the same time using two different machines from two different uh, cities. Should the system allow for it? that they both can take $100 out, the bank account would be minus 100 if that happens, right? But bank accounts don't go negative. So that's an example where you don't want to allow for a transaction that is not legitimate. There has to be consensus across these two machines serving these two different users on the same account that this transaction is not valid. Second, on on-call system at the hospital, right? At any given point, one doctor should be on call. Let's say two different doctors, they try to, um, they see that, hey, Dr. A sees that Dr. B is on call, and Dr. B says, also sees that Dr. A is also on call on the same day. So there's multiple people. So they both feel that maybe I should take that day off, right? And so both of them at the same time try to uh, take that day off. And let's say the hospital gets into this state where there is no one on call as a doctor. That's a big problem. Again, consensus. There needs to be consensus across machines that are working in a distributed fashion that, hey, this operation is valid, this is not valid. And we can go on and on. Let's say you're watching a football match, you and your uh, brother and act in the same room, but you're using two different uh, mobile phones to check the scores. And your brother says, hey, uh, this team won, and you're still seeing that the, ma the match is going on. That's a problem, right? Someone already has the latest data, you don't, right? So then there's some sort of ordering issues. Um, again, it depends on like what kind of consensus and what kind of consistency exists between these systems. And there are many such messages, right? Like uh, examples, uh, sorry, where you don't want out of order messages arriving to you, like someone answering the question and then the question comes afterwards, right? So that's another one. Same, we, talk, we looked at other examples in the past where you're trying to book a ticket for a seat and now let's say two people have the same seat, right? And that's a problem. You don't want to be oversold. Some some airlines, uh, a lot of airlines usually do overbooking, but that's for a different reason. But you don't want a legitimate system to be selling the same seat to two different users, right? Yeah. So those are examples where application developers who are writing these systems need to have some clear way of knowing whether this is a legitimate transaction or not, and whether there's consensus across um, different machines, across different data centers that, hey, this data that I'm going to write to is actually going to be leaving the system in a consistent state. So that's the theme, consistency and consensus. How is that achieved with distributed systems is the key theme, right? And in real life, there are multiple algorithms used and multiple systems used to manage your distributed system. One major one that we're going to look at is Zookeeper. It's used heavily by multiple uh, open source projects. Uh, HBase uses it, Kafka uses it heavily, and there's a whole bunch of projects. Espresso at LinkedIn uses it um, under the hood. And it's used for many, many things that it provides. But the main one, the main one, is the consensus algorithm that it has, with, which provides linearizability. This is an important concept that we'll go next. But it, it think about it as uh, the Paxos algorithm that uses it. It uh, guarantees that the leader across multiple machines that's gonna make a decision is actually the leader, right? It also enables you to use it as configuration management system, service discovery, um, many, many things like heartbeat, uh, failure detection, um, partitioning, what nodes should take what partitions of data to go through uh, when there's an offline or async system, right? Um, and various te techniques that it provides in terms of ordering and unique IDs the ZXID that it provides, right? So all of these examples, um, you need some sort of a coordinator, right? And that's what one example is an Apache Zookeeper, right? Um, it, it uses a specific algorithm. These algorithms are very hard to get right, and so you don't want to be reinventing the wheel, especially when you have a distributed consensus problem. You'd want to get 
um, uh, battle-tested software like Zookeeper or others to be used, right? Uh, under the hood, Paxos, Raft, Zab, um, uh, timestamp-based uh, VSR, and there's so many such algorithms that it uses, so you don't want to be writing those algorithms. That's the summary of um, these examples are tough to solve in a distributed setting. You want a battle-tested software like Apache Zookeeper to actually uh, make your life uh, reliable and consistent in your systems are consistent and there's consensus that you can rely on. So now let's look at this concept, linearizability, which is an important area uh, to understand. Think about, let's say a user in your website is trying to upload a new photo. They already have a photo, right? And we're gonna, they want to upload a new photo. And let's say your web service writes that new photo to the image store. It's a persistent image store. And then after it has written that, it sends an offline async queue, let's say Kafka queue, uh, says, hey, now, you know, take this uh, photo that's been uploaded and now resize it, right? And there's multiple async queues that need to fire up so that uh, there's multiple combinations of photos that get generated, right? And so after that, the Kafka queue um, takes that message and then it uses uh, this other microservice that takes the image uh, the new photo and then resizes it in you know it does image processing stores it and then stores it again in the image store at various locations which can be accessed through various paths right? so let's say that's the typical example and we, we are trying to understand linearizability why is it important to have a linear ordering in which things appear and consistently appears right so in linearizability the key concept is it should feel like your distributed system is just having one copy and it's everything is operating in a linear fashion. In this case, you have two systems, right? You have a web service and you have an async system. Imagine if your upload goes through and then the message, the number three, which is the message, right? What if your image resize service tries to resize an old photo, meaning the upload is still going through, right? and it gets this async message and it actually starts to process before, let's say, this has finished. Let's say what happens when three gets triggered, the image resizing gets triggered before the image has fully uploaded. Imagine, now the image resizer, what will happen, it'll take the old photo, right? Because the new photo is not put in yet. It'll take the old photo and it'll do all kinds of computation. By the time, let's say, number two is finished, right? It, now the new photo is put in. And then once it's done resizing, it's gonna overwrite the new photo with the old photo and the old photos resizes, right? So now you permanently lost the data. The user now will see old photo and because of this async system overwriting this online system. Why did this happen? Because this image store or this overall, this distributed system did not provide linearizability if this image store would have rejected or made this service wait when a transaction was going on and detect that, hey, this timestamp, this is number three, is trying to override number two and actually make this wait. If this service was waiting because the store was saying, hey, you want number four transaction timestamp ID, but uh, you're gonna override number two. So if this system was able to provide that uh, capability that says, hey, wait, or I will not even process this unless there's some logic here that says, I'm not gonna process this unless I have uh, data that's available that's number three timestamp and beyond. These are just timestamps, right? So there are many ways of solving the same linearizability problem, but overall the key concept is you, in, in the system, you need a mechanism to know what happened and what happened after that, right? What was the cause and what was the effect, right? And so cause was that number two was the cause of number three, which is the effect. So three and four cannot finish before two. So that ordering of linearizing what goes first, what goes next, what value should be available um, to the calls, that, that concept is linearizability. And you can do it with various ways. I give an example of timestamp, right? You could just give an atomic number that says this is one, this is two, this is three, four, and five. And so when two is in process, four can't finish, right? But only when two is done that, hey, three, four can actually finish, right? So timestamp is one way, but this, it's, it's a very naive way of saying that you could do it timestamp. There's, you can think of this as one data center. What happens if there's a second data center, right? 
Uh, and so now that you need coordination across data centers, right? So this is just a simple example for us to understand ordering where it's important to know what, ha what should happen first and what should happen next. Okay. Linearizability is an important concept um, and for consistency, you need a system that provides linear transaction. The next important concept to understand is two-phase commits and atomic commits, right? Commits that actually go through or fully or don't go through, right? So let's, let's go over this, right? Let's say you have uh, a coordinator um, and there are two replicas, DB1 and DB2. And the coordinator says, hey, I'm gonna write this data to DB1, right? And so in two-phase commits, what happens is the first step, it says, hey, I'm gonna write. So it tries to get the transaction lock on DB1, right? Um, and at the same time, it also says, hey, DB2, I'm also gonna write to you, right? Because uh, I'm, I'm gonna write to all the replicas, right? Um, in two-phase commits, there are two steps. There's a prepare step and there's a commit step. In prepare step, every replica is expected in that transaction log to respond back with a yes, saying, hey, are you ready? Are you prepared to write this new data that I want you to write, right? So at this point, these DBs need to have a log established and be sure that they can actually write. This is a point of no return. Once the DB replica has said that, yes, it's gonna write, um, uh, it's ready, it's prepared to write, then there's a second step that needs to finish, which is the coordinator deciding from various logic that it has, saying, hey, I got all my responses, and I'm gonna say, okay, replicas, go, commit. So it says commit, commit. Once that message happens, the only answer should be, yes, I have committed, right? That is a two-phase commit where you have a prepare step where you have a choice to say, no, I cannot commit, I cannot prepare because this state is invalid. Um, then, then the entire transaction is aborted. Um, as you can imagine, both of these replicas are being waited on for this write, right? So for this guarantee of consistency across replicas, you're gonna have a lock established for this long period of time where typically you might, based on how your database is implemented, might even have read inconsistencies. Definitely you cannot write on the same shared lock object. Um, so for, for this, there's a prepare step and there's a commit step. But there could be various, so uh, there could be various things that can go wrong. Let's say the coordinator dies after it sends this, yes, I want you to commit, right? Um, then what happens? And let's say this message doesn't even reach this DB, but it reaches this replica. Right? So when it has said that I'm gonna, uh, I'm prepared and it gets the commit message, it should commit. It should not wait for any other synchronization mes messages across different replicas. And if the coordinator dies, then at least the coordinator's right ahead log would have the information that it has decided to commit. And so then when it comes back up, it would reconcile the transactions, right? Overall, this consistency, right, of uh, making sure that all of your replicas has um, the latest information, right, with a two-phase commit is the only way right now, right, where you can say and be guaranteed that, hey, this, this commits are actually going through and there's no, like, mid-step process failures, right, or uh, across replicas. So that is two-phase commits, right, which is an important concept, right? It goes through or doesn't go through and in various phases, there, there could be problems, but uh, due to transaction locks, um, and this transaction was a concept we, we learned in the last video. So if you, if you don't fully understand transaction as an abstraction, that's something that we've covered in the first eight videos, right? We're building on top of all of these abstractions so as to understand like what is two-phase commits, how some of these, con you know, distributed, you know, these are multiple machines potentially across multiple data centers, how they can still continue to commit and still deliver um, the right consistent data across data centers, right? So that's two-phase commit, and at some point, it's done, right? So we understood linearizability, two-phase commits. The last piece of uh, total ordering is to how to understand ordering, right? We understood that ordering is important here. And so Lamport timestamp is another important uh, contribution by Lamport, which basically says if you have multiple DB replicas and multiple users trying to write to multiple replicas, you have this, um, variable, a pair, counter ID and node ID. The counter is, let's say, an incremental uh, unique ID that uh, increases for every replica. 
um, and node ID is basically the node ID, the replica node ID, right? So you have this pair, counter ID and node ID pair, uh, which you maintain to understand ordering. So let's assume you have this new data structure, counter ID and node ID. You maintain this data structure across every replica so as to understand where things are, right? Because if a user is trying to write and if some other user is trying to write, let's say in this case, right? Let's say user A says, hey, I'm going to write to uh, replica one, right? And so it increments its counter. It says counter equals one. It was zero before. And then it uh, returns back counter ID, node ID, counter ID one, node ID one. So one, one. Similarly, user two, user B tries to write to replica two. So it says write. So the counter ID, again, each of them started a unique counter ID. So it says one and then um, node ID two. So one comma two writes again. So counter increases to two. So two comma two writes again, counter increases to three. So three comma two, right? So four comma two, five comma two, et cetera. So it increases the unique, unique counter in that sense. But let's see what happens here. If user A is trying to write to replica two, for whatever reason, because user A now, let's say, got moved to um, the replica two because this, this entire data center went down, for example. And so when it tries to write, it, it notices that, hey, even though um, the latest replica C1 um, counter was one in replica one, it notices that when it tries to write, it gets the latest counter, number four, and gets the counter four because it's the last one was three, so it gets four, and then it says, hey, four comma two is where it gets returned. And so you realize that, hey, here it was only having counter one for this user, but now it gets counter four because this replica maintains its own replica's counter. And now it went to write to, this is the key concept. Now it tries to write to, let's say, replica one. It starts from um, counter five. So it catches up replica one even. So it goes from one to five because the latest counter it has is four. So it's very easy to know that, hey, this transaction is actually happening after all of these transactions because this counter is greater than this one right so that is that is one way in which you can you could have ordering and you could still not miss out as to what happened before and after this still is not useful let's say when you're trying to have two users using the same username right you want to know at that point you don't want to know that hey two people actually have a conflict or you gave the same seat uh, to the two different users right but this concept, the total ordering, is, is the basis on which you could implement a store, which will give you consistency, right? Let's say you now have a clear way to know what happened first and what happened later. If you couple that with uh, two-phase commits, now you have a very clear way to know what should happen when, right? So all of these concepts, right, have to go hand in hand. So they're all building, these abstractions are being built on so that applications, when you write them, you write them with higher confidence, right? So in a sense, right, consensus is basically an abstraction that says one copy, independent of how many machines you have, how many replicas you have, the end user or the application developer should feel as if there's only one database copy, right? And you do that with various types of commit mechanisms, various types of ordering mechanisms. You can use some sort of lamp or timestamp so, so that you have a clear total order of when what happened, right? And you can use some of that to resolve like what, uh, whether to say yes or whether to say no when you're trying to do two-phase commits, right? So that's that's uh, consistency. There are some other concepts, really important concepts. And by the way, yesterday I was trying to create uh, an account in Fidelity, right? And I, I wrote something, uh, said, hey, you know, take, take down my information and create this account. And I didn't get to see that account in the landing page. So I thought maybe I didn't do it. So I recreated that account and Long behold, after five minutes, I see I got two accounts created in the same account, right? So basically, Fidelity was also not reading its own rights, right? That's something we learned in the previous. Um, so it's replicas, maybe it, it, it wrote here, but then when it was reading, it, re it read from two, and so then it had stale information, right? So it's very important, especially if you're a financial bank and transaction. Um, I don't know, maybe I did something wrong, but just that example of, uh, how much consistency or how much guarantee that you need is very much important. In this case, I just called up customer service and was done with it. Maybe that's how, that's a model. That's a model of like how it's gonna actually solve that problem. But maybe that's not okay for you or for your system, right? Um, so it's very important to understand when to use some of these concepts so that you can have the right guarantees given to your users, right? Um, 
also right like uh, we we look at uh, multi leader uh, replication in multiple data centers you have multiple leaders right and then in leader election within the data center let's say you're booting up a new data center right or you have a new service that was out of rotation now you're bringing up a new service how do you choose a leader again consensus problem right so that's an important problem to have only one leader and so that there's voting and there's Zookeeper can help with all of that with linear as able to guarantee with Paxos protocol and uses algorithm that it uses. So that's an important one so that you don't have this concept called split, split brain where you have two different leaders and then they're both taking rights on the same data center and then they're overwriting each other, right? It's important. Right? Remember at the end of it, right, strong guarantees are possible with all of this so you can hold up uh, a resource for so, such a long time, but then there's low throughput, yeah? Low latency, high, high latency. You, the users will have to wait for a long period of time before everything catches up, right? And in all of these um, concepts are very important. We have to try it as to what happens, let's say you break the, artificially break the network uh, replication uh, connection between two data centers. Does it come to a grinding halt? Is there like consensus problem? Is there, let's say a leader actually fails, does it actually automatically pick up the new leader? All of these concepts we are, we are trying to do to reduce human intervention. A human can come in and, and you know say, hey, this is how it should be. These are how transactions should have reconciled. The, the ticket should have been this way. A uh, human could say, hey, no, one doctor needs to be available. But we're trying to automate all of this, right? So that when we have millions of users trying to do millions of transactions and there's hundreds of doctors on big, big hospital systems, we don't want a, a mechanical manual work by done by a human. So we're trying to automate all of this. That's why these concepts and these um, abstractions are very important for us, right? Um, and there are various guarantees, and each guarantee comes at a cost. It's very important as application developers to know and understand deeply each of the guarantees that the application and the database system and the overall system provides so that you can give the best guarantee possible and uh, not compromise on, on uh, guarantees, but at the same time, have the right balance so that you have good throughput, uh, you have low latency, at the same time, your data is consistent throughout. Thanks.